of time and space. Everywhere and anywhere, every star that ever was. Where do you want to start? Hello and welcome to All of Time and Space. I'm Mark. And I'm Ian. So, Ian, we've managed to escape from the old planet of Marinus and uh, I thought we should probably just, you know, chill out a bit. All that globetrotting in the last episode was a bit much, so maybe, you know, perhaps just chill for a bit in in one location rather than dashing about all over the place. What do you think about that idea? I think you're absolutely right. That was all all rather giddy and I think we should limit ourselves to maybe three or four... Uh, sets at most for a, a good four episodes <laughs> while we're here before we get started proper just want to thank everyone again for their feedback it's been brilliant hearing from you guys and if you're uh, enjoying all of time and space or as the cool kids are calling it aotas you could leave a review on apple podcasts or on podchaser.com and that will help us to get noticed and more people will be able to hear about the podcast so if you do that that'd be amazing so Let's take a trip back in time to the Aztecs. And on the other side of this, we'll be joined by the lovely Lindsay. Barbara? Barbara? What on earth are you doing there? They think I'm a reincarnation of that priest in the tomb. I found this and put it on, and when the high priest caught me, I was still wearing it. So he thought you were a god? Yes. If the Aztecs decide you're not what you're supposed to be, then we shall all die. This is not your type, sir. This is a false goddess! And I shall destroy her. Famine, drought and disaster will come. Where will it end, you duck? In total destruction. But you can't rewrite history. Not one line! You're monsters, sweet favoured man. All of you monsters! You have betrayed us! You have declared your love for me. I shall destroy you! And I acknowledge and accept your gentle proposal. (laughs) And welcome back. I'm very pleased to say we're joined by the lovely Lindsay from the Trek This Out podcast. Hey, Lindsay. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's always our pleasure. So, how are you keeping during this whole lockdown debacle? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. I think that's about as much as most of us can say these days. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a bonus, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think preferable so. to the alternative. Absolutely, <laughs> body and soul are still in one place together, also <laughs> at the same time simultaneously. So, yes. So, I have collared you into coming on to talk about the William Hartnell story, the Aztecs. Yes. So you and Ian, I think, share quite a few similarities in as much as you're not super well versed in the 60s stuff, which I think is a great place to start from because you'll come to it fresh and you might have different ideas from from me. If I come to Lindsay first, what were your sort of first impressions of the story? So this is my first experience of probably what um, was a trend, I know, for sort of proper historicals. Mm -hmm. So it's the first one of those I've watched. Um, It's also, like, other than the very first episode, probably the first William Hartnell I've watched. Okay. Um, I wasn't blown away. Um, Certainly about the first two and a half episodes, I was kind of struggling to kind of force myself to kind of engage. (laughs) The last episode and a half was much better. Um, Right. But it has some of the the traditional challenges of of classic Trek and that the pacing just feels a little odd sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, no, there were one or two lovely moments and some really interesting things, even if I didn't necessarily enjoy it as a story, just really interesting things about that period and about um, those set of characters and stuff. So yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And Ian, what about yourself? What were your um, initial thoughts? I, well, I think I think we are in for quite a lively chat because I have pretty much the opposite um, opinion. I, the first 
two and a half, three episodes kind of flew by. And then the last episode just went <laughs> on and on and on and on. <laughs> So, um, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot uh, a lot to unpack. But before we do that, guys, um, mm. well, actually, Mark, let's, let's, let's hear your opinion. Well, it's one I've seen quite a few times. I think I possibly first saw this back in the 90s, I want to say, on UK Gold or one of those. I see. Um, the memory does cheat, as someone once famously said. But I'm pretty sure that's when I would have first seen it. Otherwise, it would have been the DVD when that first came out. The first of many releases on DVD. So you've watched this story multiple times for pleasure? I, I have, yeah. it's. Um, I'm a bit of a sucker for 60s Doctor Who because I enjoy not just the whole thing in of itself in terms of the story, but I quite enjoy the whole thing of retro TV and seeing how stuff was made back then and the differences between then and now and... Uh, how it's uh, a different experience mm. from watching modern TV. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, anyway, before we go any further into the Aztec path, um, obviously the story was broadcast in, in May and June of 1964. So what mm. I've done, and you may you may know what's coming, Mark, you may want to run and hide. I've done, I, was, I was hoping to put this off. <laughs> I've done me little quiz, because I know how much everybody likes it. <laughs> well... Maybe the people at home do, but you know, it's uh, it's just so terrifying for me. You know, the whole thing of putting myself out there and trying to get answers correct. It's quite. Scary. I didn't. I, 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 it's, I didn't know that you tried to get any of them correct at any point, or I'd have. I'd <laughs> yeah, have made you wouldn't think easier. so from the previous ones. <laughs> well, now I'm now I'm worried that they're they're too difficult. So mm. I'm a bit I'm a bit embarrassed now, but I'll give it a go. Okay, all right. Just shout out if if you know the answer, or if you want to have a wild stab in the dark. I can differentiate okay. between your two voices, so there's no <laughs> need to buzz or have, you know, silly code words. Oh, is that thing. right? Um, what was, <laughs> what that? was that supposed to be? Uh, I think that was um, pseudo-Irish, wasn't oh, it? Oh, right, no, I thought, I thought, I thought the, the Cornish comedian well. Jethro had wandered into the <laughs> studio and was now heckling me from beyond the grave. <laughs> I've had worse. Um, so, anyway, uh, let's, let's kick on with this. Question one. Which country became a republic on June the 1st, 1964. I feel like that it would be quite easy to say something quite controversial here, so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. No, be... Is it South Korea? Be controversial. No! Oh, go on. No! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I flatly refuse to say anything controversial. On this particular um, topic. Okay, well, the answer, I'm afraid, is a very simple Kenya. Oh, that's not controversial um, at all. No, no, okay. no, no. It, was a, it was a, it was a good thing, I think, after mm. after everything mm. that we did to them beforehand. Um, yep. And when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about the British, uh, right? Um, question two: um, June the fifth, nineteen sixty four, Davy Jones and the King Bees debut their new single, "I Can't Help Thinking About Me." The group disbanded pretty pretty much uh, instantaneously, but the lead singer went on to find fame under which pseudonym? Oh, David Bowie. Oh, he's got a point. Oh, well done, that man. Oh, yes. my God. I'm going to write down the big three. That's three <laughs> questions you've got right in all of time yes, and space. Right. Okay. Question three. June the 12th, 1964. Who goes to prison starting a life sentence on this day in history? I genuinely have no idea. <laughs> I want to say, like, some gangster. Uh, yeah, I was going to say one of the Crays, Reggie Cray. You're going with Reggie Cray, or possibly. I'll go Alec for Vitti. other the other one. Um, uh, the Gary Kemp. Ronnie Cray. Ronnie yeah. Cray. The answer is in fact Nelson Mandela. Oh. Oh. So from 19, uh, well, 1964 through to, I mean that, that's, that just puts it in context. He missed the whole of the Troughton era. <laughs> John Pertwee. Um, in, fa in fact, by the time he got out, I think the show was was, it was in the wilderness years. It had been cancelled, hadn't it? Yeah. So mm. he would have gone straight from Hartnell yeah. to uh, Eccleston. Oh, like season one yeah. Hartnell as well. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Poor soul. So that's probably the... I think he might have got a bit of McGann. I d possibly, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. So actually, he, yeah. that's the best way to do we'll it. We'll miss everything until you get to McGann. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to disagree with that. No. <laughs> no, clearly that's not how I feel, because otherwise I'm going to be destroyed on Twitter. Absolutely. Uh, so, from this question four, obviously I should I should begin with. Uh, from June 1964, health warnings became mandatory on the packaging for which products? Cigarettes. It is cigarettes. Mark, you are on fire oh, tonight. Oh, my God. Lindsay's just being really kind. No, me? I was thinking about oh, milk. I have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> what do they put in the milk up where you are? <laughs> I can't possibly comment. We do sometimes call it coo juice, though. I, I think it says a lot about Scottish people that they're more concerned about milk than they are about the dangers <laughs> of smoking. No comment. Even the cows smoke in Scotland. Eh, <laughs> where's your next back in, please? I, I, I have two eyes in my name, so I'm a bit Scottish. I did notice I'm, that. I'm, a, I'm allowed. I'm allowed to be um, cheeky. I'm a quarter Welsh, so I'm kind of a bit Celtic, so... Are you though? I feel like are we are you? dangerously like drifting into something that could be as controversial as all lives matter. Yeah, do you know there's going to be a lot of um, lot of editing for you, Mark. So let's quickly just do question five, the last question. No change there then. And it's it's the sport question. June 1964 saw the unforgettable sporting excitement of Euro 1964. Name either finalist. Oh. Uh... Brazil. Portugal? Euro. Euro. No, in Euro. Bit of a clue in the name there, Lindsay. Uh, Portugal? Uh, Portugal did not make the final, no. Spain. Hungary? Uh, no, and I'm not going to sit here while you guess all the Italy? countries in Europe. Oh. Yeah, okay, we're right. going to let Lindsay have a guess, and then we're going to draw a line under it and move on. I'm going to assume it was neither Spain or Italy, because I've guessed both of those already. Oh, 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 say one of those. Say one of those. Spain. It was Spain. Spain were in the final and they beat the Soviet Union. Oh, and I said that quite early on, so I'm going to take that as a win. Famous, <laughs> famous Europeans, the Soviet Union. Yes. So and I got go. in That's trouble for Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Surprised you didn't say Scotland. Uh, no, I know more about football than that. I don't know a lot, but I know enough to know it wouldn't have been Scotland. <laughs> Fine. Uh. You make me laugh. Right, excellent. So, um, that's established, I think, perfectly um, <laughs> what was happening in the world at the time that the Aztecs <laughs> was broadcast. Um, that, was, that was the world that was happening in the background, but obviously the most important thing that was happening were these four episodes... Uh, coming at us from Lime Grove. Indeed. So this is our second historical proper. I don't really count the first story as a historical because it's so far back into prehistory that it's just, you can't really relate to it. At least, I, mean, I appreciate this is still quite mm. a way back, but um, at least it has characters that are semi-relatable. Can we start by talking about the opening shot, please? Let's do that. That would be that would be great. So it was a little dinky it Tardis. Was so yeah. clearly a dinky Tardis in like a sandbox. <laughs> so cute. It was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now this I... might have been lost on you, Lindsay, because we're obviously following this in chronological yes. order. That was the final shot of the previous. Oh, story. of course it would have been because we got the first shot of the next one and the end of this one, didn't we? Yes, ah, okay. that's so right. yes, um, not perhaps one of the best special effects shots I've ever seen. How dare you! But it was kind of adorable in its ridiculousness. Yeah, it's so cute. Yes, I just they hadn't they had certainly hadn't learned to like cheat the angles yet because it clearly looked like a toy mm. in a sandbox. <laughs> I think it's very charming, and I won't have a word said against that TARDIS prop. I think it's okay. very cute. Not at all, and it was and it was downhill from that shot. So, well, just it's not so far away from, for example, Star Trek, and I think the model used in Star Trek was perhaps better, even in the original series. Yeah, but Star Trek had more of a budget than five p. True facts. So, true yeah, facts. Could, yeah. Yeah, they had seven cents. <laughs> well documented. <laughs> so, uh, so obviously the TARDIS then immediately uh, materializes in uh, in a tomb. And um, Barbara and Susan step out and start looking at a sort of... A, is it Was it supposed to be a body or was it just a sort of table full of... I, think, a, I, 
bric-a-brac and I assumed it was their um, their belongings. There was definitely yeah. like a laid skeleton a... thing going on. I I mean it it could be like a like a you know a decaying corpse, but but yeah. irrespective, Barbara mm. leans in. Picks up a yep. nice bit of jewellery that she's going to thieve. Light fingered. Yep. And puts yep. it on. Yeah. And then and then she comes mm-hmm. out with what for my money is just by far and away, just so far and above and beyond what a, a history teacher should be capable of. She looks around and goes, hmm, I think it's uh, 1430. <laughs> it's their early phase. But hey, but it's look, her specialist you subject. Know, she might have specialised in the Aztec. Does she not so, say that as, she does? Aztec society, Aztec society, right? Begins in 1430, that's the early phase, and then 31 onwards, that's what, that's late Aztec. I just, I don't, I don't think anyone has a, like a specific year, okay. is there, is there early I phase? Specific, like, I think that, so I have some questions about how much she knew about quite a lot of stuff through this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but one, she said it was her specialist subject. <laughs> Um, and mm-hmm. two, it's a historical, and clearly they were trying to teach yeah. us things. Now, yeah, well, she's a history teacher. Well, as I so, say, well, yeah. I did not know that, so that makes more sense in some ways mm-hmm. as a history teacher. Yeah, because I just thought she was a teacher, like a primary school teacher, I guess. Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. So yes, that does make more sense. We'll come back to this, I think, but the parallels between contemporary historicals and this as a historical mm-hmm. were really interesting in terms of teaching and showing and stuff. Yeah, I mean, that was the remit of the, the show when it first started. It was meant to be an educational show. So in the last of the historicals that we covered, there were lots of various things that were dropped in rather uh, cleverly into the, the script that you would hardly <laughs> notice, like um, how water forms on cold surfaces and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And, uh, so, yeah, you know, you, you have to kind of take it for what it is. Uh, I think this is definitely... Barbara's story this is her sort of time to shine and weirdly myself and Ian have been pretty much I think well I'm trying to think we haven't really had a go at her but most of the stories she's been the one character or one actor that's really nailed it on pretty much every story whereas the others have been a bit up and down Uh, and with this one although she's sort of front and centre I'm not sure it's her best story. I don't well, know. Well, I think this is where my my difficulties with the whole thing kind of come in because it doesn't really mm. work very well as a story. I j- like if it felt, you know, a Barbara has to know so much in order for this to work, mm. um, as well as being like fingered. Um, and getting the jewellery. She then does an incredibly good job of convincing them that she is this god straight off the bat. And the Doctor... And maybe this is just because I haven't seen a lot of Hartnell, but some of the things that he does and says... I'm like, really? Really though? Really? Oh, here, have this magic to use against your opponent and I'm not going to realise that it's Ian. Like, mm-hmm. ah, or like accidentally getting engaged. I'm like, really? Oh, that's charming. That's lovely, isn't it? I mean, we'll come back think? to that later, but I'm not sure if that was an accident. I think he was thinking, oh, you know, what what, what stays in South well, America? Well, it did feel a little bit like Sherlock Holmes <laughs> getting engaged in order to, like, finish a case. Like, he needed to exactly. keep the woman, was, like, um, ticket over because she was giving him information he wanted. Exactly. It was like, mm, keep them sweet, Chesterton. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, and I suppose in some ways... I'm used to the Doctor being a bit more all-knowing. So, like, mm. in my experience of the Doctor, the Doctor would be like, oh, Coco is this thing that they use as, like, a, a bonding ritual. Like, he would have had all that information. So this idea that he mm. wouldn't have known what he was doing it seems unlikely. I suppose you have to remember he's, a, he's just a kid starting well, out. Well, he isn't is. He? he absolutely is. And again, it's just yeah, a different it's version of the Doctor. Um, and yeah. this is obviously yeah. the original version. Apart from those 52 previous ones <laughs> that they just shoehorned in. Well, you know, um, he's right, the original one that, that we saw. Hole. Yes. Yes. That's true. Yes. Which I think is different. We can all agree on that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you, I'm impressed with Ian, actually. Um Arian. He's got a Vulcan Martin, neck pinch. Oh no, that no. Other yeah, Ian. <laughs> Arian has been rather dismissive of Ian Chesterton. Okay. 
it has to be said. I uh, have, yeah. But I think he's really come into his own. I wonder whether... Because he is quite handy, isn't he, in the old uh, hand-to-hand combat? You're, Do you you're, that's think... the word you'd use, is it? Handy. <laughs> well. <laughs> Vicious, effective, yeah. lethal. Well, oh. I mean, delicately tapping... Pla- you know, wooden swords with a, an equally fey opponent. Yeah, that, that's Does because the wooden sword dread- would fall to pieces if they did anything more than delicately tap. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, the the thumb, the the trick with the thumb, and there's two places yeah. he could have shoved that thumb, and mm-hmm. I'm not going to speculate as to <laughs> as to where it went, but it certainly did the trick. It's a Vulcan um, neck that- bitch. All right, or so he's. Bitch. So uh, he's- th- yeah, but no, no, I think you'll find it's the Chesterton neck pinch because uh, this was. Broadcast in 1964, Lindsay. Oh. So they they stole That's it from us. Star Trek. Yeah. Okay. The Chesterton nerve. <laughs> the the cheeky <laughs> Chesterton <laughs> thumb. Up. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he did a bit of the old national service, because this was he could have started done. out in 63, didn't they? And I think yeah. it ended in 63. So I reckon he would have spent a couple of years on national service, learning all that combat stuff. So that's why he's so handy in the old uh, punch ups. Okay, so we That's my theory. So we'll we'll leave the thumb to okay. one side. The rest of the time mm. he has to go through a series of uh, sort of interminable wrestling matches with um <laughs> some incredibly bewigged men. Um and it's a lot of sort of cuddling and holding and sort of gently <laughs> dropping and it's not the best fighting I've ever seen. No, it's not going to rival Bruce Lee, is it? But um, no, it's not going to rival Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> You've got to remember this is from the same stunt team that are also responsible for the special effects that involved the toy Tardis sitting in a sandbox. <laughs> All right, just let it lie, will you? <laughs> well, if, well, it very nearly did. It very nearly blew over well, the catwalk yeah, past. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> Ian Cullen that played Ixter, yes. uh, he's interviewed on the DVD and he said they had awful trouble. He started off by saying the wigs were terrible and then he was like, oh, actually no, the, the wigs were really nice but they just didn't fit my head very well. So he's trying his best to handle this fight but try not to move his head too much so he doesn't, his wig doesn't start slipping. <laughs> and then of course they have to put on the ceremonial headgear. So he's got a, was it a bear or something or a, um, oh, a, a jaguar or something? Or something? Yeah. And, and Ian, uh, Ian's Ian, got this eagle. Well, he spends most of the story dressed up as a giant metal chicken, doesn't he? <laughs> I love that. But he said it's even worse when you've got this thing on your head because it's kind of, it's sliding inside the helmet. So you're really sort of just here everywhere. having to move around with virtually no head movement. Yeah, uh, hilarious. <laughs> to be fair, Ian like has one or two moments of like, so the doctor almost kills him. And mm. then he moves. Yeah, yeah nice, nice move there, nice dog. Move dog. <laughs> uh, he then moves a giant stone slab. Like that thing would weigh like a ton. Um, mm. And then he climbs into a watercourse thing. And then he yeah. almost drowns. Well, now you say that, but let me stop you there. So, he, how does he get out of it? He climbs up into, the, into a sort of parallel corridor above. And when he pulls yep. himself up, he is completely mm. bone dry. <laughs> Okay, so there's a continuity. So I'm not sure well, that he was the in... air passing through the uh, the conduit that he's just crawled through. Ian, come on, don't you know about these things? Come on. Mm, I don't think a man passes from a body of water into a body of air, <laughs> bone dry, <laughs> unless he's using that. What was that stuff we had when we were kids that was sand that you put under water, and it's and it comes out oh. again and it's bone dry. Oh uh, yeah. That yeah, was amazing, but that's a tangent. Science we can magic. Talk about that another time. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, so so the Doctor <laughs> almost gets him drowned, but then he ends up back in the tomb. And rather than, like, move the TARDIS out of the tomb, or <laughs> get <laughs> something to prop open the door to stop it yep. from yeah. closing. Yeah. yeah, Ian had some moments. Mm. They all had moments, though. Um, and we haven't even got to Susan yet, who I just don't understand. What is? I don't, I don't get her. I just don't. I don't understand that she's supposed well, to be six it, or sixteen or twenty-six or. Well, this is this is the uh, this is the story where she gets to go on holiday for two weeks. So you'll have noticed she's out of the story oh, for quite a while. Yes, she gets sent the seminary. to the seminary. Seminary. Yeah. Yes. Having a See, I thought I thought this was one of her better stories, but um, now I know why because she wasn't <laughs> in it. Well, it just um, she's, she she's just throwing straps and like 
I would like to think that mm. the granddaughter of the Doctor would have a better understanding of the fact that this is a historical setting and they would think it was appropriate to tell you who you were going to marry and while you might believe it's not you aren't going to change their minds? Yeah, Yes and no because I can imagine your average teenager if they've been having a great time in 1960s London and then they get dragged off to whatever year it is in Aztec time. It's 1430. They're probably going to throw a... Yeah, oh, it's sorry. exactly 1430, Barbara okay, knew that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Get it right. So if if she's then dragged off to 1430, she's probably going to throw a bit of a sulk because, you know, she's probably enjoying the swinging 60s. But we're now, what, six stories into this, aren't we? This is our sixth and... serial. Yeah, yeah, I know, but... but just, right. She's just a bit of a whiny brat. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm not loving the season. Yeah, it is... It... It's pretty much the uh, law of diminishing ah, returns, okay. in uh, in my opinion. In her stories, she's she has some good stuff early on, but it's I'm afraid for me it's downhill, pretty much all the way. I think so for me, like coming in at this drive, because like I say, I've watched very little uh, of this kind of era at all. There were mm. very specific roles that they each play. Like, Ian is clearly there to be the muscle. Action man, yeah. Yeah, and do the action man stuff, which is, again, <laughs> it's something we've seen later on, so it's definitely a thing mm-hmm. that happens to Doctor Who. Like, you could have a yeah. boy to do the action man stuff. Yep. Yeah. And then you've got to have a woman to do the... To be fair, she's Barbara's not this for the most part, but you need a woman mm. who will need rescued. Or in this yeah. case, be mistaken for somebody else. Like, that's a thing that happens regularly. Like, you know one of the women is mistaken as somebody else and ends up mm-hmm. like being taken away by a group of other men to do this thing. Um, mm. And then Susan's just there as a whiny child. Um, <laughs> it, it just, yeah, it kind of... Yeah, it just... The whole thing was a bit odd, really. Talking of odd, we haven't yet mentioned Latoxel. <laughs> now, is he John the one Ringham. with the mouth? He's the one who's got yes. too much lippy on, yeah. He's, uh, yeah... <laughs> Richard the Third in drag. <laughs> now he ha- he only had one bit of direction from the director, and that was make all the children of Britain hate you. He was. And, uh, I think he took him to his word on that. He re- he's what any of Alan Rickman's characters could have been like had they not been played by Alan Rickman. <laughs> oh, imagine it! Imagine he imagine would be him in Die excellent. Hard. Excellent. Shoot the glass. <laughs> 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 but you know what I mean? He's, he's just. He's taken the villainy and, like, cranked it up to 282. Well, I, I mean, yeah, Mark, you got it absolutely bang on when you said he was basically being Richard III. I've, I've written down here. I'm not he the sounds, first person to have said that. Well, well, possibly not. I, I, I don't claim to be an expert. Um, mm. But he sounds like David Mitchell trying to do Richard III. <laughs> Or some <laughs> ghastly interpretation of John Nathan Turner. Nice. Um, I think he's. Uh, I think Dominic Cummings probably learned a lot from him in terms of uh, very scheming and manipulative. And and in episode three, where Tlaxolotl goes to Durham for no reason to get his eyes test. In the in the pantheon of, of villains that we've had so far, and obviously, Lindsay, I don't know your. Um, exposure to 60s who in its entirety but wh- where are we placing him are we is he one of our favorites is he one of fandom's favorites or is he regarded as a bit of a silly uh, for me i've only really seen uh, i've seen the war games and i've seen the tomb of the cybermen right and he's not as good as the 60s cybermen no and he's not as good as the war chief or the warlord either, is he? No, <laughs> Mr. Mika from <laughs> Rent a Ghost. Absolutely. As yeah. the, like, he's all right. Like he he isn't he didn't spoil it for me, but he did very much seem like he was in a different production to the rest of the cast. That's very true, actually. He was. Uh, everyone else seemed to be playing it as straight as they possibly could. Yeah. He was. You got Keith Pyatt who plays Ortlock, who's the sort of. He's the one who looked like Doc Cotton. Yeah, yeah, he was a, a very grounding presence. I thought. Very, yeah, he, yeah, he a had very this quiet. Kind of, you know, very. But I suppose yeah. that was kind of the point. Was so yeah. like so, in terms of the teaching points, within about the first five or ten minutes of the episode, we've had two different groups of characters tell us exactly the same thing about the fact that um, they weren't just vicious; they were also creative mm. and intellectual and yeah. all the rest of it. 
So you've kind of set up right from the start that what they're doing is trying to get us to realise that they aren't just vicious. And then they introduce a lipstick man who is <laughs> vicious and ridiculous. Maybe he's born with it. Maybe he's just a twat. No, um... <laughs> Twat's a lot all. That's easier for me to pronounce on a personal <laughs> level. So I'm happy to go with that for the rest of the episode. <laughs> So there's Lipstick Man and his yeah. acolytes um, in yeah. the Feisty Boy. Sorry, Ixter. I'm Ixter. There we go. Feisty Sorry, the names boy. are not... So Ixter. Tw- tw- Twatalotl and Feisty Boy. I think that I think I bought one of their albums recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was back in that shoegazery phase, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early yeah. 90s. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So what you then need is Ortlock to come along to show us that there is more than just the Feisty Feisty. Yeah, but he then doesn't use any form of logic to analyze the fact that he has been hit over the head with a bat that, be- that looks exactly <laughs> like many other bats, but belonged to Ian. So therefore, Ian must in fact be a thing, and Barbara must in fact be a false god. I mean, welcome to sixties Who, Lindsay, because that you know <laughs> that's not that out of the okay. the norm for a lot of these things. Yeah, I was expecting. Just go with it. You know? I was expecting some more to be made of. You know how how do you know that you were hit over the? How do you how do you know he was hit over the back of the head? Um, yes, that felt um, like it was going to be a thing. Which is kind of a you know yes massive smoking gun. Ergo, I didn't do it. Kind of proof, but it just kind of got lost because uh, in the in the last episode, Ortlock decided he'd had enough. <laughs> Um, he couldn't stick around for another 25 minutes, so he uh, retired and wandered <laughs> off into the desert to look for some gin and his little dinky police box that he'd left out there. We have to remember, though, that these guys haven't watched as much Sherlock Holmes or Poirot as we have. So, you know, mm. their they're yeah. crime true. analysis skills were maybe not up to up to snuff. Well, yeah. I think in 14, 1430, Agatha Christie had only published the first three or four of her mm. many novels. So, um, <laughs> yeah. They would only have had a very sort of nascent idea of what was happening there. Yeah, murder in Mesopotamia even <laughs> yeah, was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little uh, a little before yeah. or a little after this time. Uh, yeah, so there's just the whole thing just seems like and like Barbara's ability to just spout stuff that convinces them that she is in fact their god is uh, yeah, yeah, beggar's belief is the phrase that comes to mind. Is she one of the very first examples of what's now be- become known as populism? She would just say any old tosh to get <laughs> just to get power a vote. and just you know. Ah. Well, there's that there's that bit where she starts sort of pointing and looking like a stuffed drunk parrot and going, "Get Brexit <laughs> done, get Brexit done," and everyone, now, yeah. Um, now, Lindsay, I know this is something that sometimes you get. Uh, quite excited about what what were your thoughts on some of the costuming choices um so uh, i it's, it's very difficult for me to comment on this because i don't know enough about the aztecs um mm. the costuming mostly seemed to be very costumey um mm. i have to say barbara's outfit was delightful it was great yes i'd wear that in a minute um susan <laughs> wasn't wearing hot pants and a vest top so you know that also is so so what often acts as a bit of a red rag to me is like oh look here's a woman wearing no clothing because that's what they do Mm -hmm. um and actually there's not an awful lot of that in this i don't think or at least not that i noticed there's there's definitely some people walking around draped in sheets but that's mostly in or not draped in sheets draped in skins Mm -hmm. um in the garden of tranquility or whatever it's called with all the retired people in it yeah which is now that's a fantastic society, isn't it? You get to 52 and you retire mm. and, and hang out in a garden. How many of them get oh, to on, 52, to though? To How well, many I mean, of them reach 52? I mean, none. I would imagine they're all dead by <laughs> yeah. sort of 32, 33. <laughs> Except so for the was garden it? was quite busy. Yeah, who came up with it this was, magic yeah. figure of, of 52? Maybe the god Probably the same person Barbara who came did. up with the idea that the world was going to end in 2012. Ah, yes. So the, there's the garden where people just seem to randomly roam around and have discussions. So the Doctor gets really obsessed about architecture. Now, obviously on one level this is because he needs to get back into the tomb. Yeah. But it just seems for a, for a quite a while that he just gets obsessed about architecture and this woman. 
and he gets really excited about the fact that he's met this woman and she knows the son of the person who built the tomb and it's a whole big thing. Well, I'm sure we've all feigned an interest in a topic we don't really care about in order to <laughs> get close to someone we find a bit cute. Surely. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, not, I'm taking the fifth. Not architecture. <laughs> I, did, I did once have to watch virtually all of Midsummer Murders. Um, That's a wow. lot of TV. That's yes, commitment. I know. Um, it was. Uh, it must have been very nice. Well, no, because it was. It was. It turns out it's awful. <laughs> news oh. news flash but um yeah, yeah. so um yeah i thought that garden was wonderful this sort of little oasis of calm and and mm. lots of people knocking around not not doing very much compared obviously to everyone else in the story whose day-to-day life seemed to involve sort, sort of plotting a bit running around a bit and doing some stabbing yeah or sitting in a seminary and learning random facts yeah, that was pretty random, wasn't it? Some of the. <laughs> well, I, I just like she learns this whole screed of stuff, but it's like she doesn't have any problem with the fact that she's being asked to regurgitate stuff that she probably knows is not true. But as soon as somebody mentions his marriage, then she throws her toys out of the pram. Yeah, it was, uh, it was inconsistent, shall we say? Yeah. The the writing of that character. But um, going back to, were, were we on costumes before I sort yes. of sidetracked Yes, we were, us? yeah. I'm sorry. So we've got Ian's amazing metal chicken outfit. <laughs> we've got yes. Barbara's lovely frock. Yes. Uh, the Doctor yeah. didn't really sort of bother um, no, changing no, his still... clothes in this one. He was still, mm. you know, very, very trad. And Susan, I thought, quite a nice, I'm guessing, silk sort of sleeveless top. I've got very little to say about that, if I'm being honest. I'm just trying to show willing. The... Um, <laughs> The Aztec, I think they look they look great for you know for the fact that this is 1964 and it's a kids program with no money. I think yeah, and, and yeah, I think they had to use a little bit of artistic license because I I get the impression yeah. I could be wrong that a lot of the Aztecs didn't wear an awful lot at all. But seeing as it's a kids show, they I mean it's a warm country. Why would you? It, it just wouldn't make yeah. sense. You know, a little loincloth to keep. So so here is yeah. the controversial statement for a historical that was clearly designed to teach people stuff. Like, they didn't really cover where the Aztecs lived. <laughs> no. That's true. At no point no, did anyone true, yeah. turn to the camera and go, here we are in South Central America, um, possibly somewhere near Peru, I don't know. Um, you're right, that's a huge glaring... Uh, Un- unless I, I missed think... it from the very start where Barbara's waxing lyrical about what you know we're in. But I... Well, she, maybe maybe mm. she also said we are also... It, it's it's 1430 and we are at an exactly grid reference 32 <laughs> by 3 north-northwest well, by south. And, and me- or maybe it was left on a cutting room floor somewhere, but it, like, it, it feels like they knew where they were coming to... Because otherwise, or, you would you would step out into a tomb and be like, oh, it's a tomb. Oh, it looks like an Aztec tomb. Oh, maybe we're in wherever. And this looks like it's from this period. Like, but we didn't get any of that. Possibly the Aztecs was something that was covered by the school curriculum of the day. Because if you were making yeah. if you were making that kind of story since you know I went to I went to primary school in the eighties and and we did Egypt. And if someone had mm-hmm. had said to someone at the time, you know, write a story with with a a tomb and a hot country and a a, a strange primitive culture, and a, it would have been Egypt. So maybe the Aztecs was much much more well known um back in the 60s that doesn't sound very likely but i'm offering it as a possibility maybe it was just more of a a zeitgeisty place and they possibly. didn't feel the need possibly yeah maybe but if, if it, it was well known enough not to have to cover where they lived then why cover when they lived mm. anyway uh interesting perhaps <laughs> i did feel a bit for barbara because obviously she's cares passionately about people not dying and she thinks she's doing the right thing by forbidding them to to do any more sacrifice so she stops the guy from getting sacrificed and then it's then revealed that he's mortally offended and upset because he really wanted to die and so he ends up chucking himself off the top of the temple anyway (laughs) so she then is left thinking oh god i've made a complete twat of myself now and she's really painted herself into a corner I think it's good because it does give you the insight into a bit of their culture. I know it's not, you know, super representative, but it's not like these people were being dragged to the place and then being killed. They they actively wanted to do it. 
Yeah, and it's that's a, in some ways it's a much harder argument to ha- or harder discussion to have because they might have mm. wanted it, but that didn't make it right. Yeah, and we'll not get yeah. into it, but there's an awful lot of difficult conversations or nuanced conversations, I should say, to be had about all sorts of historical peoples about what they believed or what they believed was in. You know what they were institutionalized into believing, mm-hmm. and which in some ways would be the case here. I think you would have to argue. I found a par- a really interesting parallel in this episode and uh, Rosa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they're both situations. They're both historicals where by the doctor is basically trying to get the the companions or the fam um, mm-hmm. to. Ex- I love the idea of William Hartnell called, yeah. referring to his companions <laughs> the as fam. the fam. Well, to be fair, they're, um, <laughs> they're more familial than the fam currently are, I suppose. Anyway, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, they're both sort of... Or the, or the situation would lead you to expect them both to be helping their companions to understand what's happening and the importance of them not interfering. Mm. Um, because however you feel about the 13th Doctor, for me, that scene on the bus is heart-wrenching as they don't... Yeah. Inter- like, they become a part of what has happened. Whereas, what goes on with, with the Aztecs, like, it's kind of like, oh yeah, this god came back to life, and then she vanished, and we haven't changed history, though, so it's okay. And you're like, but, but you clearly have, because you brought a god back to life. Like, that feels like a problem. I have a hot take about about Barbara's behaviour in this episode, which may be complete nonsense, but but it's my hot take and I'm going to stand by it. So, Is it she's a kleptomaniac? <laughs> all right, I've got two hot takes about Barbara in this <laughs> Maybe she was possessed. Oh, maybe she really was channelling the attacker. Maybe the attacker she... was in fact an alien <laughs> and had special oh. alien jewellery. So when Barbara picked up the special alien jewellery, this, mm-hmm. this is how it would have happened in modern who. Yeah, this is this is what would have happened is in Jodie. Tax well, not even in Jodie yeah. Who, just in like any Who after after the the rebirth, um, it would have been an mm. alien god. The alien god would have had alien tech, and when you put on the alien tech, it would have given you all the alien knowledge that you needed to pretend to be the alien god. I'm just writing this down. I'm going to submit this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure so, it's anyway, probably been my... done anyway. <laughs> my thing with Barbara. So she is a history teacher. History yeah. is what she knows, and it's it's solid and it's unchangeable and it's a fact. And I would imagine in the last few weeks of her life, where she's been blasted across the universe from pillar to post, tied up, shot, knocked unconscious, been in fear of her life, whatever, the one constant thing in her life that she could cling to for emotional support would be her knowledge of history. And as soon as she gets back into history, she just wants to start changing it. Now, I don't know that she would want to change history. I think she'd be much more comforted by letting it play out exactly as she wanted it to. I don't know. Do we think historians want to change history to make it more fun to teach, or, or what? Um, I think I think a contemporary history teacher would maybe have a different understanding of history and the decisions that were made there and the peoples that lived there than perhaps a sixth history teacher might have done. That's a good point. Like I think the duality of acknowledging that something is wrong, but it's how it was done, is something that we are perhaps better at accepting now. Like not perfect by so, any stretch of the imagination, but yeah, it's like watching but, but, old TV and acknowledging that it might be problematic. I suppose it's easy to say, "Oh, we should let it play out." But if you just say, for instance, you could actually get dropped into that situation, and you're there front and center. How would you feel if you had to stand by and watch someone get killed? Would you not want to intervene? I, sp- I suppose you're you're weighing up your your kind of human instinct on the one hand, and mm. it's it, it's head versus heart, isn't it? Your your heart mm. wants to intervene, your head says you can't do this. And if say if Danny Pink had been a history teacher, not a, not a maths teacher, and he'd been dropped into that position, I imagine he'd have had a, a slightly different response to that struggle. It's difficult because, you know, if, if somebody said that I could go back and stop the Titanic sinking, would I? Well, if it's not a fixed point in history, then of course you would. But for me, in my Doctor Who watching, I understand the idea of fixed points in history. 
or not, because we ignore that rule sometimes mm. because we can. Because um, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> it's science fiction and it's TV and it's delightful. Um, <laughs> but it, and again, I have to keep reminding myself that this is really early on in Doctor Who and the. Because, like, why has the. Do- like, I can't believe we've got this far and the Doctor hasn't already had a conversation with him about don't be changing stuff. That's a very good point. Why is this then... Like this is their sixth what, adventure. Second or third, yeah. Second yeah. or third historical, if you include the the one with the cavemen. <laughs> I, I think if, if they're not based on real historical characters, then it's not a real historical. So, But absolutely, it should have been like the... the, the majority of episode one of Marco Polo should have been and this mm-hmm, this is why you can't change things mm? Mm. but uh, yeah you're right it's like suddenly having left it too late and he's the horse has bolted he's he's got a grasp on the stable door but I it's too late for me so so in the so a contemporary who doctor would probably be going oh, isn't this fascinating? But, oh, we need to get out of this situation because we're going to mess it up. Like, that is the Doctor's, like, kind of, the dual nature of their excitement and also their awareness that they can't be getting involved, they're not supposed to be getting involved. They then obviously do get involved because that's how it works. But, like, that wasn't in any way what the... Like, the Doctor just seemed to think it was a bit of a laugh. Yeah, I mean, I'm th- I'm thinking on the one hand, uh, when you said that, I suddenly thought of maybe the Tenth Doctor in Pompeii and how he's sort of very very kind of distressed by what's happening but he knows that he can't mm. intercede and then you offset that yeah. with with the first doctor and the really quite cruel way that he, he was you know when when Ka, was it Kamika Kamek I can't yeah. pronounce it you know she's she thinks they're they're in love and they're going to get married and he yeah, he turns awesome. around and says to Ian mm, it's nothing it's neither here nor there i mean and that that's that's, that's what felt very Holmesian to me in that kind of because like in one mm. of the original stories Holmes gets engaged to a, a parlour maid or somebody um, because he needs information on what's going on in the house and Watson pulls him up on it and he's like because he, Watson can't believe he would do that just for a case but <laughs> but you know what I mean isn't it? it's, that's, that is, it is exactly the same dynamic you're right yeah and, and that's and, and it is terrible, and I don't like to see the doctor behaving like that. I have to say, like he, the doctor wasn't somebody I was particularly fond of in this story. No, no, and I suppose we're 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 lucky that it wasn't a David Tennant story because he definitely would have got off with her. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on which companions were around at the time. We might have had like some kind of uh, woman <laughs> versus woman fight if Rose had gotten there. I d- well, yeah, but you say that. But then, what was Rose doing in the the girl in the fireplace when he's all, oh, me and Madame mm. de Pompadour? <laughs> he didn't go away. Well, it wasn't men behaving badly. That would have been a very different. Program. Oh, the doctor <laughs> behaving badly. Yeah, that'd be great. It would have to be I'm Matt not... Smith and uh, <gasps> when he lives with them, um, James Corden. Oh, grief! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm not a Gallifreyan, as you know, but <laughs> Totty, you were marvellous. <laughs> but it would almost be hysterical because Pat Smith would manage to make it hysterical, I suspect. He would. He would. Anyway, sorry. Oh. Getting back to the point. So, this is not to say that I don't clearly, this version of the Doctor is what, is what everything else is built upon. So, he's an incredibly important part of the history. And this is only one story in many. But he just, he just didn't come across very well to me. I think it does vary from story to story. I think some stories he's very tetchy and a bit gruff, whereas in others he can be quite sort of fluffy and lovable. I, I don't know that he was either of those extremes in this. He just... Hmm. He, he, uh... There was a lot of kind of like, oh, Ian, you go and save this person. and Yeah, he didn't seem to really solve any of the problems that he caused. I wonder if there's an argument that at some point in the show, when he is this kind of all-knowing, wise, benevolent figure, we can sort of point back to stories like this and go, it's very definitely because the character learnt from his mistakes and his behaviour in these early stories and that ultimately shaped him into the, the hero figure that he became. It'd be nice if we could do that, but 
it's it's more by luck than accident. I suspect so. <laughs> but we do yeah. tend to get much more of like the companions being sat down and told you must not do this thing before they are let loose in the world. Yes, and he's straight out the straight off into the garden to go and get off the. Well, let, let, let's let's keep... There's a there's a. There's a layer of hypocrisy to the Doctor. Clearly. Oh, there always is, though, and that's part mm. of the joy of it, isn't it? Yeah, you can't change history except for when I change Gee. history. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. own or somebody else's. Yes. You can't change history, even in this case, where she's definitely up for it. <laughs> I can't, so, so one of the things that I enjoy with Doctor Who, and I do this like every time I watch it, I think, is, is wondering what it would be like if you put another Doctor into a particular story or situation. Like, yeah. putting Peter Capaldi... In his doctor, like the twelfth doctor, into uh, the story, I think that's quite yeah. an interesting kind of. Well, it would have been absolutely lovely, wouldn't it? Just to. Well, I, I just some of the business he'd have brought. Well, to I it. just I like I, I kind of love the idea that he would have gone. Well, what did you do that for? Like, where did you where did you get that bracelet? Why did you do that? Like, did <laughs> yeah. I not tell you not to pick random stuff? Up? <laughs> you you what you want to die? You want to lay down there and have some guy kill you with a stone? Why would you want that? Is your life that boring? <laughs> Do you not have football? You know, he'd say something you like that. Have you would not be... heard the guitar solo in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that... And so for me, a part of the joy of the continuity of, of the Doctors is that you can kind of think about that. And actually, sometimes it works really well. And when it doesn't, it, it allows you... This is me overanalyzing now. To think about whether there's something in the story that wasn't right or whether there is a particular personality trait in one or other of the Doctors that doesn't quite kind of work. But uh, mm. I would have loved to see Peter Capaldi in the Aztecs. <laughs> I've watched him in anything because I just think he's one of the best actors to ever play the role. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... Oh, yeah, he got tarred with a lot of nonsense. And I think opinion will certainly soften... The further away we get from his era, and we're not quite so close to it, I think there will definitely be a reappraisal because I think he, I think he's very popular within the fandom. I think as a whole, from my experience of speaking to people, but I'm not sure whether that translated to the general public. Yeah, but such. I think there, there's always more going on. In the same way that we need to to watch 1960s Who in context, we mm. need to understand that TV yeah. was changing so much at the time where he was the Doctor. Like streaming to cough, yeah. I think I would probably say while he was the doctor, yeah. and like the nature of television changed, and maybe a Doctor Who wasn't where it was, and maybe it still isn't. The culture of um, the culture of the Saturday night TV battleground changed as well, didn't it? Because suddenly, uh, te- television wasn't really about the big Saturday nights anymore because the variety shows weren't doing what yeah. they used to do, and. Suddenly, you know, it's a it's a format that doesn't quite fit the time slot anymore, and and the medium's changing, and mm. you know, and not only that, they're coming off the back of the fiftieth anniversary as well. So there's no way on earth you could sustain that momentum that had been built up for that anniversary year and keep it going after that. No, and this so, is very I true. think Clara yeah. was so integrated into to the fiftieth anniversary kind of in the end of Matt Smith's era that she brought a lot of baggage with her which did not necessarily help however getting back to the Aztecs well I'm not I'm not going to sit here while you're nasty about my Clara oh, my <laughs> yeah I've got a soft spot for Clara as well oh, oh it's hot isn't it I Ian might, do you want a moment I might have to turn the, uh, the fan on <laughs> I might faint um, I did I wanted to and and you know, I guess we've been talking for a long time now and we probably should think about winding up. But I did want to mm. read you a quote I found from the BBC Audience Research Report for part oh, three yes. of the Aztecs. So this was like yes, a sort of, tell. you know, as as it went out, they'd ring around their mm-hmm. sample group and try and establish the public mm. opinion of yeah. of the show at that time. And they reported a general falling off of interest with many viewers preferring the show's earlier space-time encounters, i.e., mm. I think, the Daleks. And so what What I got from watching the Aztecs, and um, and I watched it this morning for the first time, um, and I loved it, and it, it just felt so fresh and different and not kind of 
hidebound in the way that the show has kind of become, where it's so formulaic and oh, there's a Dalek, run down a corridor, fiddle with this, do a wave your Sonic, mm-hmm. blah 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 blah, and it's so kind of populate itself. Whereas um, this story wasn't. And here you can see the public kind of as early as 1964 Hmm. urging the show to become this kind of very safe, very predictable, very uh, very generic sci-fi show where they presumably did just want Daleks and Cybermen every other story. Hmm. And I think that's a shame, but what do I know? At this point in the show it can be anything and it is so... Well, it's certainly from our experience... I think I can speak for you as well, Ian. The ones we've watched so far in this run that we've been on, it's just the sheer variety of the stories you're getting and just seeing something different from what you would have seen in Modern Who as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't get these pure historical stories. There's always got to be some kind of alien involvement if you're not counting the You see, it's interesting because I think you're right that joke, like we're joking aside we did talk about it would have been an alien god and it would have been an alien piece of kit and for a long time that was true mm. but interestingly Rosa was the one where the alien was complete throwaway like you didn't really need yeah. it there at all they could have just chosen to go mm-hmm. back and that would have stood like you wouldn't have had to change yeah. anything in that so do we think that the the time travelling racist was only included because someone at some level in the BBC insisted on a science fiction baddie or or evil element? Or just because they did like I don't um, know that somebody insisted on it, but it is what you have in an episode of Doctor Who. Like you would like I don't mm. know how you would have been able to submit a script that didn't have anything sci-fi in it. Yeah. Room. But by the time by the time you're Chris Chibnall though, and presumably he can pretty much write what he wants to write. So surely he could do a much more pure historical. There was this feeling with his first series that he was kind of going back to the early 60s and having a bigger TARDIS Mm. team and the stories were kind of opening up and being a bit less predictable. And and maybe, I don't know, I think a historical like this would absolutely Mm. work now, but it would involve the show kind of taking a step back from doing what it's done for so long and becoming a much more you know broad church if you'll pardon but, again, but what we've just established uh-huh. is that even when they were making these that wasn't what the audience wanted to watch yeah well yeah, yeah that's true but the audience are often wrong about things ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't we know it hashtag people are nonsense I think if you look at something like Demons of the Punjab from the first of Jody's series that although there was an alien element to it it wasn't it was never really about the aliens no. but i think for me that's that's you that's see, often what that, historicals that again, are they're just not really yeah. about the alien there's just there is an alien there yeah. but it's not really they were about literally the just alien. thrown in to sort of occupy 10 minutes of story and not get in the way of the plot which makes me think very much there there is just a rule in the doctor who handbook now that you have to have some sort of alien monster in your story and and Chibnall sort of maybe wrote those two stories with a view to well we'll keep it to an absolute minimum if we have to have one of these but I don't really want one and we don't need one so here here's the thing I don't know that well, he, he certainly Mar, um Marjorie uh, Marjorie Black- Mal- Blackman Mallory Black- Mallory Mallory Blackman wrote Rosa Good point. with Good assistance point. I think so Chris Chibnall probably wrote the random alien th- yeah. person mm-hmm. um and I don't think he wrote Demons of the Punjab That's either. That's Patel, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yes, I suspect if you are sending something out to external writers, you probably do have to be like, by the way, there's usually an yeah. alien. Um, <laughs> we'll all get into terrible trouble if you don't put an alien in. It's not like <laughs> Top Gear. Oh. <laughs> well, no, but, but so I suppose here's the question. If you take the aliens out of these stories and they just... Because like the doctor does often take people to go see things, mm-hmm. or often there are, like a lot of the interludes that we don't see in the TV show are them just coming back, having been to Mardi Gras or having been to this incredible festival at the end of the universe mm-hmm. or whatever it is. So it's not that the doctor doesn't take them places to see things. Yeah, I think if you look at something like Vincent and the Doctor, where the space chicken is fairly incidental to it, really, and it's all about those character moments with Vincent, isn't it? Yeah, it's just the the motivation to go back. So they go, because yeah. they, they start at the museum, don't they? Mm-hmm. And then they see the space chicken yeah. in the painting. Mm-hmm. 
and that's what makes them go back. It it almost feels like you ju- you need you need a reason to get there yeah. if it's going to be an actual episode. Mm-hmm. There needs to be a bit more than just oh let's go see this thing because that's just everyday life as opposed to something exciting enough to write an episode about. I would just quite like them all kicking about in the TARDIS though, like not doing anything particular, just <laughs> kicking about and making tea and fighting over who has to do the dishes. <laughs> Oh, you need to watch The Edge of Destruction, then. <laughs> Is that what happened? <laughs> well, no, there's a little bit more to Or just does nothing there. happen? Well, no, they all go a little bit crazy and start trying to kill each other with scissors. But apart from that, it's fine. Oh, it's what happens well, when you have to stay indoors, I'm telling you. Exactly, yeah, it's <laughs> lockdown fever. Do you have any favourite moments from this story before we wrap it up and give it a score? Ian, have you got any favourite bits that you really enjoyed? The thing we haven't really talked about, and there's no reason really why we should, but I think the gentleman's name was Tonila, who was like the sort of yes. second in show. He was a curiously unemotional, expressionless man who didn't really <laughs> seem to give much of a shit what was happening. Um, Having seen him being interviewed on the DVD, he was saying that he was actually a dancer. Right. And um, at this time where lots more people were gradually coming into TV, having done theatre yeah. and movies, he just got to know people who were in TV and they said, oh, why don't you go in for this? So he just put himself in for it. So I think he was very much a dancer who was cast right. so in an acting part. That explains his sort of not not really <laughs> understanding what's going on, kind of. Cause, <laughs> or lack of yeah, acting. Yeah, because I've got a well, T-shirt on tonight yeah. that says, Tanila, just don't give a shit, um, and, <laughs> uh, which I found on eBay. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Is that based on the Honey Badger? <laughs> Yeah, classic viral video there. Look it up, folks. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't really point to a favourite bit. I think uh, just John Ringham's general shtick as to 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 as the baddie. I think he was very good as the baddie. Yeah, I can't do those. I'm from Essex. I I can't speak. Well. Let's let's ignore the bit where he just completely fobs her off and breaks her heart. But I do love the stuff with Kamika in the the garden. I think that's really adorable, and where they make the the cocoa. It is also just... possibly the worst example of tell don't show mm. I've seen in a while when mm. she has a conversation with someone about how the significance of making the cocoa drink. <laughs> Again, this is, this is part of the educational remit of the program, Lindsay. You need to get with the program and clearly Lindsay have you got anything nice to say about it oh of course like, yeah absolutely <laughs> like, I didn't hate it um, I, I I enjoyed the Chesterton neck pinch <laughs> yeah yeah. That was up there. It was literally right up uh, there. That's why the guy passed out. <laughs> <laughs> and also the doctor's face when he realised he'd killed Ian. <laughs> <laughs> the first time. The first time. Yeah. Okay, then. so shall we rate this out of ten? We have the benefit, Ian and I, of having watched the previous stories leading up to this, so it gives us something to kind of gauge it against. So we both really loved the missing story called Marco Polo, which is by the same writer, John Lucarotti, and I gave that one a nine, I think. So I'm. it didn't rock my world quite as much as that. It's enjoyable, and I would watch it again just for pleasure, but I would probably give it a 7 out of 10 for me. Lindsay, what would you yeah. score this one? It's, it's really hard when I, like, I haven't seen much of this era and it's, it's not... Just in, a, in and of itself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 5. I'm going to say 5 out of 10. Okay. It's okay. It, has, it had one or two interesting moments. Mm-hmm. It, it was, it's not yeah. going to make you rush out and watch another William Hartnell anytime soon. No. 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 It's a shame. <laughs> Ian. I think I am going to echo you and come down on the side of a, a big fat seven. It's it mm. was enjoyable and that that really should always be the the kind of the most important aspect of it. Although yeah. a little caveat within that, I enjoyed it because I've you know I've had lots of spaceships and monsters and I'm I'm if anything I'm approaching middle age so I'm allowed to enjoy something like this. <laughs> but I do wonder if kids at the time were kind of bored legless yeah. by it yeah. yeah um but yeah i'm gonna go with a seven i think it was very enjoyable it was mostly mm-hmm. very well well done and the time mostly just flew by oh that's good that's good okay so now that we've given it a score i think it's time for a bit of feedback i've got mail 
So it's feedback time, and thank you once again to everyone who has taken the time to tweet or put their feedback on Facebook. I have got one on Facebook from Mr. Mark Atkinson, formerly of Prog to Who, and I'm sure he'll be back at some point because, well, you can't keep a good man down, can you? So Mark Atkinson says, I, I put out a post saying, uh, any fans of the Aztecs? And he said, yes, one of my favourite Hartnell stories. I loved it from the first time I saw it on its VHS release, and every time I've watched it since. Great story, 8 out of 10. So that's my feedback. Ian, who have you got there? I have got a basically a private conversation between two very good <laughs> friends of our show. Uh, David Kitchen, who joined us... Um, uh, very recent. It feels like only the other day for um, yeah. Marco Polo, I believe. Um, yeah. He's he says of the Aztecs, another classic Hartnell historical. This time, making Barbara the centre of attention. The baddie is one of the great villains of the Hartnell era, and the guest cast is superb. Another ten out of ten from me. And then, mm, quick as a flash, a like, Rob Irwin comes straight in with David liked it so much he went to the real location. Now, much like what we were saying earlier about no one actually explaining really what the location really is, I've got a picture of David Kitchen um, standing sort of near a mountain, and there are some rocks and some some trees. But I, I've got no idea where that was taken. I mean, it could be Jordan. Um, it, it could be Milton Keynes, to be fair. Uh, who knows? Um, but David goes on to say, I did. One of the most amazing places I've ever been to. The detail in the design of the buildings and the town is quite remarkable, even down to the acoustics to ensure someone speaking to the crowd from on top of the Pyramid of the Sun could be heard in the streets. A wonderful place. Oh, that's excellent. A beautiful insight as yeah, well. Yeah, there's no... Like he hasn't that. included any of the... Um, the sort of cloth backdrops in the in the back of his photograph <laughs> with all the the township. Can you see the sandbox and the toy uh, Tardis? <laughs> oh, you, oh no, he's trodden on it. In the, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you guys. And Lindsay, who have you got there? Uh, so I've got the Sirens of Audio. Um, so yes, it's the best of the serious historicals. Beautiful performances from Hill and Hartnell. I can watch this one over and over again. And then the lovely Suki uh, says, love this story. My favourite complete historical. Barbara and the Doctor are wonderful in this. And a great bad guy who isn't evil as such, but believes in his culture rather than a false god. Uh, which Suki raises an interesting point that he was in mm. fact correct. She is a false god. Yeah. That is a, <laughs> so he's, yeah like, he's, he's, he's in no way a villain or, you know, he's, he's, he's just a guy doing his job very diligently. Hmm. So, um, so then I've got Paul Quinn. Um, it's amazing. Doctor Who is Shakespearean tragedy, one of Hartnell's best and one of the best pure historicals. And then last but not least, Tom Aaron Meehan. Um, it's one of my favourites. It's brilliant. I feel like uh, I am the lone voice in the wilderness who did not love this. But that's well, in okay. fairness to you, you're seeing it in just isolation aren't you you're not I seeing all the stuff that's going on around it so maybe you know if you get to see a little bit more 60s who you might grow a little bit more attached to some of the characters or you might just get a bit more into the sort of the rhythms of how it works and it, you might just become a bit more attached to it mm, quite possibly it's, it's like everything as well I might just have been in the wrong headspace for it this week no yeah, maybe maybe so thank you very much for joining us, Lindsay. It's been an absolute pleasure, as ever. Bless, thank you for having me. It's been lovely. Before you go, would you like to give a little plug to some of the things that you've got going on? Mm, absolutely. Um, so uh, a very nice man called Mark had me recently on uh, his podcast called Nerdology, uh, where we oh, spoke yeah, about yeah, Buffy. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's a really good episode, I think, so you should definitely listen yeah, to that if yeah. you have any interest mm. in Buffy. 
Yeah. Um, but mostly I can be found on Trek This Out, um, which is a Star Trek podcast uh, where we mm. discuss an episode and usually fall out with each other um, and then <laughs> yeah. decide which one of us is the worst podcaster and therefore <laughs> needs to be put to death like a red shirt. Um, We're not introducing that into this show because I'm just going to be getting that every single episode. I feel like if there's only two of you <laughs> voting consistently, it's going to be stalemate mm. more often than not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a really good listen, so you should definitely come and find us. We are available on all the major streaming services, um, and mm-hmm. you can find us on Twitter at Trek This Out Pod. Excellent, a bit of beautiful plugging there. Well done. Thank that you. was so professional. It was like a, it's like you're a local radio broadcaster, <laughs> and there is no higher praise. <laughs> Bless. <No. laughs> oh, in another life, maybe. Oh. Well, that was tremendous fun. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so yeah. much. And me and Ian are going to go for a cup of cocoa now. Aren't oh, we? Absolutely yes. we are. Yes. Now, who's making the cocoa, though? That's very oh. important. I think as long uh, as it gets drunk, it doesn't matter who made it. Uh, uh, who will <laughs> prepare the beans? <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten that phrase. We could... I sh- I sh- well, what's worse is that Hartnell deliberately dropped most of his beans all over the floor of Studio <laughs> One, but that's the mental image none of us And need. on that bombshell. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, it is. Thank you, guys. It has been a lot of fun. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email us at mailbagofrassilon at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at Time and Space Pod, and you can also find us on Facebook. If you want to leave some audio feedback, there is a link in the show notes. You can use your phone or your computer and leave up to 60 seconds of feedback. Or if you're listening via the Anchor website, you can click on the message button and leave your audio. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you to Momo Tempo for providing our theme music.